So you've just finished assembling the parts for your brand new gaming PC, but you get to the all important final stage, cables and wiring. Whether it's providing power to all the components from the PSU, connecting any RGB fans or case lighting up, or dealing with the all important front panel cables, you either don't quite know where to start or are just stuck with one or two you can't quite seem to get right. Well, in this video, I'm going to be covering off the definitive guide for everything cables, wiring, and power related for your next gaming PC. PC. Let's do this. The Aura 16X is a gaming laptop that is built to last with the latest Intel Core HX processors and NVIDIA GeForce RTX 40 series laptop GPUs, running at a maximum of 140 watts. You get cutting edge Wi-Fi 7 support, Microsoft Windows 11 as standard and power delivery over USB for speedy Type-C charging. The 16 inch 2560 by 1600 display is sharp and looks the part, while plentiful storage and DRAM slots make this machine powerful and upgradable. Learn more at the first links in the description below. I'm going to split this video into a few key sections, starting with power cables, including PSU extensions, then working through to front panel connections, that's power, reset, USB, audio on the front of the chassis, and finish things off by looking at RGB. Everything from the universal 3 and 4 pin to proprietary systems from Corsair and Ender XT. Please, please use the timestamps below to navigate through to the bits of the video that are the most important to you. Now, let me start off with power. And before I actually go ahead and wire up this system, which you can check out in the card section now, what power cables do you actually need for a gaming PC? Now, there's a few key components that need power in every system. The two main ones are the processor and the motherboard. Now, the processor power cable comes in a four plus four pin form factor. Typically, these are eight pins all joined together, but they split in half, giving us that four plus four pin name. We power up the CPU via dedicated CPU power connections at the top left of the motherboard. The number and form factor of CPU power connectors on your motherboard, be that four or eight pins massively depends on the CPUs that motherboard supports. For example, a low-level Ryzen 5 7600 only consumes about 65 watts of power, meaning that 336 watts, which is the amount provided by a single 8-pin power connector, is more than enough. So why then will some boards have two sets of eight if you're only going to install a Ryzen 5? Well, it might be that those boards also support higher power Ryzen 5, 7, and 9 chips that need potentially hundreds of watts more power than the plucky Ryzen 5 that you plan to install. Additionally, you'll also find extra power on some boards if they support overclocking to allow you to push more power to the CPU to overclock it if you wish. Now, it doesn't hurt to plug in all of the CPU power connectors your board offers. Typically, two eight pins is pretty standard across most motherboards. Entry level boards might have a single eight or a single eight plus four. If you are going to overclock and you've got a high power CPU, make sure you put all those CPU power cables in as you may find that it's insufficient if you're lacking four or eight pins in total. The next component that needs power is the motherboard and this takes the largest amount of power of any part with a 20 plus four pin motherboard power cable. Some modern power supplies will just join these 20 and four pin connectors into one 24 pin block while some allow you to split them out if you wish. This is going to provide power to the motherboard board, which in turn provides power to lots of other components in your system. They have a little clip which is actually going to secure onto the notch on the slot on the motherboard. So A, they'll only go in one way round, and B, if you want to remove them, you need to push this in, pinch it, and squeeze the cable out. Another common power cable found on pretty much all of your systems will be the GPU. Now this is where things start to get a bit complicated, as there are two types of GPU power connector. The older, more traditional style is what you call a 6 plus 2 pin. Now this can be confusing with the CPU, as if you're 6 and two are joined up and your four and four for the CPU are also joined up. They're both eight pin connectors, but they're different. They have a different shape and only fit in their respective port. Now, the number of these that you'll need will massively depend on the GPU you go for. In this build, I've got an RX 7900 GRE that takes two eight pins or technically two six plus two pins to use the correct terminology. But things with GPU power are changing and that is where things admittedly get a bit more complicated. You may have heard about these NVIDIA GPU power dongles. Now, on one side, you'll find these 8-pin power connectors the same, the exact same as what's on our 7900 GRE to my left. On the other end, you'll find a super compact 12-pin connector that's really, really tiny that plugs up to the GPU. This is all part 
part of the ATX3 and PCI Gen 5 power upgrades that look to simplify the need for two, three, or even four GPU power connectors down to one cable. That cable looks a little something like this. Now these can take up to 600 watts of power depending on the power supply, but you'll find a little figure on this side of the connection indicating the wattage that particular cable is rated for. Now this dongle exists for power supplies that don't natively support this PCI Gen 5 power connector. My advice now, given how long this has been around for, is to only buy a PCIe 5 ATX3 power supply if you're going for a card that has a Gen 5 connector. I mean, heck, even if you aren't going for one with a Gen 5 cable, it would be highly recommended. Now this cable is a bit of a game changer, really. I'm a fan. There were some issues with fires and burning to begin with, especially when the dongles were involved, but we're long past those now. Again, look at the power cable your GPU needs. Check the product photos on the manufacturer website and you'll be able to tell which connector is required. So that's the three main components covered, CPU, motherboard, and GPU. But what about these cables that also come included with pretty much all power supplies? This is a Molex cable, while this is a SATA cable. Both historically existed to power storage drives. Molex cables are what used on really old hard drives. Then SATA came along as a much better standard that was easier to install and was used on both three and a half inch hard drives and two and a half inch SSDs. Now you'll probably find that through the advent of NVMe drives, you don't need either of these anymore for storage. However, the SATA standard in particular has been adopted by case manufacturers as a way to power up various things like integrated RGB hubs or lighting on a case, fan controllers. And you can see here what that cable looks like. It is notched, so it only goes in one way and is a friction fit. There's no click in place. It can be a little bit delicate, so do try and be careful. Molex cables are becoming more and more rare. And if you've bought a case that requires any Molex support, you probably shouldn't have bought the case. It's probably super cheap or super old and wouldn't be advisable. These just don't fit in nearly as nicely as what the SATA power cables do, which are of course much more modern. Have a look around the rear of your motherboard tray and see if your case requires any of these SATA power connections. If it does, you want to plug these in to power up RGB hubs, fan hubs, and any lighting, as I say, that's on the case. So that's power cables, but what about power supply extensions? I get a lot of questions about these as well. Are they safe? Are they legit? What do they do? Now these particular models come from a company called Easy DIY Fab. Not sponsored, bought these myself, really like them. Basically what they are is a universal extension that take the power cable from your power supply on one end and then plug into the desired component, much like the original cable would on the other. These are often sleeved and come with combs that look really, really quite nice and are aesthetic. Nothing else, nothing less. They don't improve the power delivery. They don't degrade the power delivery. Arguably, they add another point of failure because for every connector you're extending, you're plugging in an extension that may be loose or not quite plugged in. Which brings me on to my next point, troubleshooting. Now, in terms of power troubleshooting, it's the first place I would start. Check all of the cables are seated correctly. If your build does not boot when you first put it together and you're confident the power cables look okay, check the connection both to the component, be it the GPU, motherboard, or CPU, and to the power supply. So that's power. Front panel is next on the list. And this is the area I know. Power is a little bit easier. When it comes to front panel, that's where things get complex. Now here you can admire my work in progress cable management, as this is the best way to show you what those front panel cables look like. Now as a reminder, front panel cables are for the ports and connectors on the front of your case. That's USB 3, USB C, power, reset, your headphone and mic jacks. That's what these cables do. Now there's a few cables to cover off. Let's start with audio, shall we? HD audio is basically the headphone and mic jack. Might be separate, might be one combined jack on the front of your chassis. Now this typically goes to the bottom left corner of your motherboard. It has a pin missing, so it will only go in one way. Now the pins are delicate. You do need to be careful, but they're quite hard to break. I've never really seen someone mash a HD audio connection up, so try not to be the first. This is easy, that's out the way, nothing to worry about there. Next up are our USB connections. Now again, you've got a couple of different types. This one here is the most modern. It's your USB 3.1 Type-C Gen 2. What do I mean by that? It's your USB-C port. Simple as that. This again is notched, only goes in one way, so be careful, and does tend to protrude over the top of your motherboard. The cable's thick and sleeved, mainly because of the amount of power and data bandwidth it's got, but do be careful, as this can be fairly fragile. Stepping down the speed to normal USB 3, these are for our Type A ports, and you'll see the block gets much bigger. This is notched, though only subtly, so you'll have to look really closely to see it, and actually has holes for all of the pins that go in on the motherboard. Typically, USB 3, Type A, and Type C ports are positioned on the right-hand side of the motherboard. The final connection is USB 2. Now, USB 2 is becoming increasingly less common for the front panel of your case, because obviously brands are moving to Type A and Type C USB 3 ports. However, USB 2 is very commonly used by brands that want to interface in a USB capacity with your system. For that reason, you'll very often have USB 2 connections to plug in. They look very similar to your HD audio, but a different port is blocked out, so do be careful. These 
These typically plug into the bottom of the board. Your motherboard will normally have at least two and up to four USB 2 connections. You can get USB 2 splitters. If you've got loads of RGB hubs, loads of devices that want to plug in via USB 2, you can buy splitters cheaply on Amazon, eBay, or your preferred retailer. Links will be in the description below. The final one of our front panel cables, and I believe it's hiding in here somewhere, obviously is scared of my demo, is our front panel, often referred to as JFP1. Now there's two basic types. This is the easy type. What the case brand have done here, Montec in our instance, have combined all of the little fiddly pins into one block that is easier to plug in and looks very similar actually to our HD audio and USB 2.0 connector. But some manufacturers will give you all the individual pins to do yourself. I'll pop a diagram on your screen now that shows you what to do, but try and get the positives and the negatives the right way round and plug in each individually. You'll find different connectors for the power switch, reset switch, power LED and hard drive indicator LED. The good news is if you get these wrong, you are not going to ruin your system. You're going to have no fires, no explosions, but if your system doesn't turn on, the JFP connections are very often a sign of where things can go wrong. That then brings me next up to the RGB connections. Now there's two standardized RGB connection types, four pin and three pin. Now confusingly, four pin is the older standard while three pin is the newer standard. You'd think newer would be more pins. No, three pin is the same size as four pin, confusingly enough, but has a pin missing in the middle. Now the three pin RGB standard is what you call a dressable RGB, whereas the four pin isn't. Basically, the four pin says, what color would you like? Hmm, red, and everything goes red. Every LED, every RGB node in that system is gonna be red. The three pin addressable standard says, hang on a minute, I've got a hundred different LEDs, whether it be five in one fan, five in the next fan, 20 on a strip, all connected in one big chain. Which colors would you like on which individual RGB LED? And that's where you'll see those cool rainbow puke effects that some people love and some people absolutely hate across the system. Now you'll often find three and four pin RGB headers on the motherboard. You can control what these do and what the devices plugged into them are lighting up as within the software suites for the motherboard brands. But things aren't always this simple and some brands decide, nope, we're gonna have a proprietary system instead. Let's look at Corsair first of all. Corsair have two standards currently at play. They have their older, really, I don't wanna call it dumb, but it's their dumb standard. The benefit of this connection over the universal three pin type is that they actually do click together. So you'll find there's a lot less likelihood of accidentally pulling these apart and causing problems in your system. The way this works is you have a centralized hub which connects to your motherboard via a USB 2 header and to power via a SATA header, which you then plug all of the various fans RGB strips into to control within Corsair IQ software. You can load up Corsair IQ, run the wizard, and it will detect all the devices plugged in via USB 2. If you have any problems, make sure you've got enough USB 2 ports on the front of your system as you'll need these for continual control. More recently, Corsair have enabled what they call their IQ Link ecosystem. What it does is basically connects all of the devices via another proprietary connection standard and allows for much more granular control. And I'm not just talking about RGB. This cable provides power and data, meaning you can actually give certain devices in your chain instructions. For example, you can plug in a load of RGB fans and then a liquid cooling pump and tell the pump what speeds to run at. And all of that information and data will be passed through the fans. Of course, that IQ Link, it shouldn't really matter what order you plug in the devices. Just beware that per hub, you're naturally going to have a limit. That limit changes, but check the documentation linked in the description below. Again, once you've got all those RGB cables plugged up to the respective hubs, run the IQ Link wizard when you first open up Corsair IQ, and it will automatically detect the devices at play. There are other manufacturers as well that are worth noting. NZXT is another. Again, this is a very, very simple system if you understand it. There's a centralized hub that connects via a USB connection to your motherboard and via a SATA power connection for power. That is then what you're going to plug all of the various fans and devices into. Load up NZXT CAM and this will give you good control over the RGB in your system. If you have any problems with any proprietary RGB, one of the best things to do is just unplug all the RGB devices and plug them back in one by one. It can be a lengthy and arduous process, but if you've got one device that's not quite working, then it's a good idea to try and isolate and discover which that device is. So that then is cables and wiring, but there's one thing, one crucial thing about the cables and wiring I've forgotten, and that's fans. There are two types of fan connectors, a three pin DC direct current or a four pin PWM. Now, if you have a pump in your system, be that a custom water cooling pump or a pump for a CPU all-in-one cooler, not all all-in-ones use this pump standard. Some again, go through USB 2 and have a proprietary piece of software you use instead. You want to plug this up to the AIO pump header at the top of your board. This is three pin DC. Fans are then going to plug up via the four pin PWM fan header to any of the fan connections on the board. You can buy fan splitters if your board doesn't have enough fan connections and these are again relatively cheap. You can control 
fan speeds often in the motherboard BIOS without any problems. And generally speaking, you'll find that motherboard vendors have fan control, customization within their various motherboard software suites. Now, if you're wondering why you've got a fan that might not have any standard fan connection, you may find, like in the case of Corsair IQ Link, that all of this is handled through software and through a USB 2 header to your motherboard. Don't panic, but if you've got fans that aren't spinning, ensure that any four pin PWM fan headers are indeed connected and plugged in. Cabling and wiring your system up can be a really, really difficult thing at times. My best advice, take it slow, and if you need to, remove the GPU to allow easier access to the connections on your motherboard. It can be a great idea to do the cables and wiring as you go and get the fiddly front panel cables out during the middle of your build rather than leaving everything until the end. Was this video helpful? Let me know in the comments below. Subscribe for more awesome PC building tips, tricks, and tutorials. And if you're in the market for a new gaming PC, check out a range of gaming PC build guide videos in the cards section now. Thanks for watching. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.